Hello, everybody. This is Vivian Xavier, and we're back for another edition of Diff uh, Talks. Um, today, we're talking with uh, Dr. Allison McMahon, and uh, she's an award-winning screenwriter, documentary filmmaker, uh, and an author as well. Uh, her most recent documentary, Bare Hands and Wooden Limbs, which is uh, from 2010, was narrated by Sam uh, Waterston. She is currently in post-production for her... Um, feature documentary, which is called The Eight Faces of Jane. Uh, she's also the author of uh, the films of Tim Burton, Amazing Live Action and uh, Amazing Live Action in Hollywood. Sorry about that. And uh, she's also the writer of the award-winning historical story of uh, the first woman filmmaker, Alice Guy Plaché, the visionary, uh, sorry, lost visionary of cinema. It was translated in Japanese and Spanish, and it was made into a play and also uh, a documentary called uh, Be Natural uh, by Pamela Green that came out in 2018. Today, we'll be talking about Alice Guy Blaché and uh, uh, we'll be referencing some of the, uh, some of the research that uh, Dr. McMahon has done in her book. So uh, without further ado, please uh, let's welcome uh, Dr. McMahon. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for having me as part of your festival. It's uh, an honor. Uh, no, thank you for uh, taking the time to talk to us. Uh, this, I mean, just learning about Alice Steve Blaché has been a revelation for me. And uh, I'm a little uh, uh, perplexed as to why not a lot of people know about her. Uh, because she is indeed the, uh, the epitome of what film revolution is. Um, you know, I mean, everything we know about film and how it is done, uh, basically just came from her. So um, I'm going to start off by asking, how did you come to know about Alice uh, Blaché? And uh, what was the tipping point for you to go ahead and tell a story and let the world know what uh, what she's all about? Well, um, I started out, I was still in film school. I went to New York University Film School in New York City. And um, I was working on a documentary for um, a public cable station like they used to have uh, about uh, women getting the vote. And I had a camera woman working with me. It was just us two. And we were going around and interviewing some older ladies who were still, you know, had been alive then and were still alive in the 1980s. And um, one day we were sitting on a sidewalk in New York City. You can't do that anymore. We were just sitting and resting and having lunch and reading the newspaper. And my camera woman said, hey, they're showing films by the first woman filmmaker at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. So we decided to go see it, but we'd been shooting all day. We were very tired, carrying our own equipment. It was very cold, it was March. And uh, we went to this screening and the screening room at the Museum of Modern Art is very warm and the chairs are very comfy. <laughs> and they didn't have a pianist. They were showing silent films because all of the first woman filmmakers films are silent films, except for a few. Uh, and uh, I just, I think I saw three of them and I fell right to sleep. So I basically missed the whole program. But, this story is kind of embarrassing. I should stop telling it, shouldn't I? <laughs> uh, no, 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 please go ahead. So then a few years later, um, I'd, I'd been making films for a few years, hadn't thought about Alice anymore, but I I was married, I had my, my baby, I had a baby girl, so I was at home and I was just reading film magazines and I looked at all of the temple films that were going to come out for the summer. And all of them were directed by men, the main roles were played by men, everything was produced by men. I mean, not woman, not one woman in like, a hundred films or so, like not even one. Things are a little bit better now, but this was like 1991, 1992. And I thought, well, uh, is my daughter gonna grow up in a world where no one talks about women filmmakers? Cause I know they're out there. They're, you just don't read about them in magazines like the one I was reading. So I decided, I remembered the first woman filmmaker, Alice Guy Blaché, and I thought I should write something about her. So then I had to track down the films, which was actually really difficult. And I went to the woman who uh, curated 
that first program that I saw and I said, hey, I want to go see those films again. This is like seven years later. And uh, she told me where to get them. So there was uh, six or seven films. Uh, and then it took me 10 years to find the rest that still survived at the time. So I started with six or seven films that I could see on 16, 16 millimeter. I had to hire a babysitter, travel into New York City for the day, rent a room, put in a projector, put the films on the projector and sit and watch them by myself. This is like pre-digital era. Then uh, I began to, um, I decided to get a PhD and write a book about her, but it had to be properly researched. So. I started going to archives all over the world, you know, it, and it, mm. that's why it took so long because every trip took a long time. So by the end, I'd identified about, I had identified or I'd helped other people identify or other people told me about films. I don't want to say, make it sound like I did it all, but the, the fact that I was looking encouraged other people also to tell me about what they had. So in the end, we had about 111 films. And in the years since then, they found about another 150. So about 150 of her films uh, out of the over 1,000 she yeah. produced, wrote, or directed. So that's a huge loss. So that's one reason why we don't know about her, because the films themselves were impossible to find. And most of them probably don't exist anymore. Uh, you, you're a cinematographer, so you know the first films were shot using nitrate film. It's an unstable film. It causes fires. The fires it's caused at times are very famous, so I don't have to talk about that. Mm -hmm. But also uh, in World War I, film stock was recycled to get the silver out of it to be used to, for making ammunitions. Uh, so, and then there were warehouse fires, so films would burn down, and they didn't make as many copies as we do now they they would yeah. have one or two copies so if you lost both copies you were done there was no yeah. left. It, it was also it was also correct me, uh, correct me if i'm wrong but uh, early on they would also make just positive the ones negatives and then uh, positive they would just make the positives first and then dupes were made and you had about 18 or 19 runs and after that you know, you had to make a new film, right? Exactly, exactly. That's one reason why we don't have her very first film. Uh, and, and there's a lot of controversy about that, about uh, which was her first film, when did she make it? One of the reasons is the films made were, were positives and you had to run dupes off of the positives. And after you'd run like 80 copies, which you sold to clients and they carried away, then your your film was uh you, you know burnt out scratched up mm -hmm. messed up and you couldn't uh use it anymore so what alice would do if a film was popular which her very first one was was remake it and we have found one of the remakes so we have a pretty good idea of what her first film looked like and uh i'm positive that the one we have which was made in 1899 was a remake and that she did make her first film in 1896 as she said but there's a lot of people who want to argue about that. So. And she's uh, from, I, I think, uh, very late into her life when um, when a retrospective or something was sort of uh, being done off her film. She is the one who wrote 1896 in one of the margins of, uh, uh, of a magazine or something like that. It, it, yeah. Because everyone thought that, you know, the her movies came after 1896. Right. Um, part of the problem is the films, the earliest films didn't have credits on them. Mm, yeah. They started putting actors' names on them in the U.S. around 1912. And then they would just have the company brand. Like for Leon Gaumont, which is who Alice Guy made films for, uh, what mattered to him was a company trademark. And if you worked for him, you know, your work was for hire, he owned everything. There wasn't this idea of an auteur filmmaker who had at least uh, um, uh, the creator's, you know, ownership over his product, or at least the right to have his or her brand and name on it. That concept did not exist, which makes it a lot harder to know who made what. You have to really dig into the archives, dig into the papers, assuming that you even have those. Yeah, because I, I did. I basically spent 
all my life doing that. I, I can imagine how difficult now. Yeah, I can imagine how difficult it must have been for you because, like you said, um, there weren't any credits. And for a very long time, some of her movies were just credited to her assistant directors who were male. Right. Um, so they, in effect, uh, you know, um, they got famous because the names were on these movies. Um so just so, just finding the 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 right work must have just been uh you know now, one, of, one of the reasons why that happened that that other people got credited for her work is because they took to credit see she alice worked for uh, um gourmand from 1896 to the march of 1907 and she left because she fell in love with her cameraman herbert blache who was eight months younger than uh, eight years younger than she and right before they announced their engagement to Gaumont, Gaumont transferred Herbert Blaché to the United States because Herbert Blaché had a French father, but he'd grown up in England. So he spoke English. So it made sense to Gaumont, who wanted to expand into the U.S. market, to send his English-speaking cameraman to the U.S. Mm -hmm. to promote. He was promoting the Gaumont sound system. Um, the Gaumont had invented uh, a device called the chronophone, which was a, a cinematographic camera and um, a phonograph, a, a record player. And they were connected through a telephone cable and they had like a control box that they called the orchestra conductor. And you could play the two in sync, but someone had to be there kind of fiddling with the knobs to, to make it stay. And of course that meant that your film, your talking film, the sync was beautiful. It worked pretty well. Uh, as long as you had the right person running running the show, and Alice Gee was very good at this, and she directed over 150 of these, so she could also be seen as a mother of sound cinema. But the way they made them is um, she would direct the actors and record them on the phonograph first, and then she would film them, and they would be lip syncing with their own performance. For the first few years, that's how they did it. And because of the limit of the phonograph length, your performance could only be four minutes long. That was the maximum length of the phonograph that they had. So those 150 films were all like for, you know, just a few minutes. And most of them were songs or dances because they wanted to show off how great the synchronized sound worked. Um, and that's what Herbert was sent to the United States to do. He was sent to promote the synchronized sound system. So she married him. She, she, she had to choose career or marriage. She was 33. If she was going to get married and have kids, now is the time. A lot of women are still familiar with that conundrum. So she quit, you know, the job. She'd been working full time for 11 years and she went with her husband and she thought her film career might be over at that point because she mm. knew, you know, once she got pregnant, it would be game over. Right. So she helped her husband uh, set up a chronophone studio in Flushing, New York for Gaumont. And then she had her first child. So she wasn't directing anymore. Meanwhile, there are all these men, she men, she had trained some of them like Romeo Bozzetti and um, Victorine Jasse who had learned most of what they knew from her, from, from being uh, directors under her when she was running the whole studio and was produ mostly producing. And, uh, and then they would go and, and try to get other jobs with other film companies. And they would say, oh, I made this film at Gaumont. I made that film at Gaumont to make themselves look good. Well, they hadn't made it. She had made it. But she was in the U.S. Who was to know? There were no telephones, no... Yeah you know, no way to keep track of it. So that's why uh, some people are credited with her films. But we've worked out most of that now. Uh, I think our record of who directed what is pretty good, pretty good for now. I'm, um, I'm, I'm just going to uh, go back to one of my uh, questions, which is about I was being like a, the, the first true female filmmaker because uh, she was using narrative. She was the first person to use narrative. Everybody else well, was using that, it more. That's actually not correct. She was not oh, the okay. first person to use narrative. It's, it's um, I mean, talking about first, 
is very complicated from a scholarly perspective, uh, but I'll try to keep it simple. Um, the thing is, the first thing you have to do is define what is a movie. So you had some animators, people who made cartoon-like films, like Emile Renaud, who drew, he had fiction stories, like this family, husband and wife, swimming on the beach, very charming little film. But the images are painted on acetate, and the acetate squares are inserted into a window in a leather belt. And then you would have this long leather belt with the images on it, just like film, but before celluloid. Celluloid hadn't been invented yet. And then he would screen that and he would perform over it. You know, he played the lecturer job. So that was before anybody made a film like what we call film. But why don't we call that a film? Because mm -hmm. it's an animation or because he's using a leather belt or because his images are hand drawn on acetate squares. I mean, I actually think he deserves more credit than he gets. I and mean, one problem with him is that when the Lemires and Meliers came into business, people stopped going to see his show and he got depressed and threw everything he had into the river. And we mm -hmm. only, we only out of his hundreds of films that he made, we only have two that survived by accident. So let's get back to Alice Ski. So at the time she started making films, you had the Lumiere brothers who had invented a movie camera that could project. You had Edison back in the US who had a camera that you could only look at, you know, through a kind of viewer, the kinetoscope, but it was made before the Lumiere camera. And then you, you had Melies who saw the Lumiere camera, tried to buy it. The Lumiere's wouldn't sell it to him, but there were people in the UK already making movies like, uh, uh, his last name is Paul, but I don't remember what his first name is. Uh, and he went to England and he bought a camera off of that guy. And then he brought it back, modified it himself and started making movies with it. So the competition was everybody was like neck and neck. The race was, was on. However, the Lumieres started making actuality films, but they made one fiction film that we could look at now and say, yes, this is this film tells a story. It's called La Rosé à Rosé, the, the gardener watered. And it shows a man uh, watering a garden with a hose and a boy comes behind him and step, steps on the hose and it cuts off the water flow. And, the and garden, then he looks at it, yeah. Yeah, and he gets a face full of water and then he chases the boy and gives him a thrashing. So you have a beginning, middle and end. Water the garden, water dries up, boy gets a thrashing. And that film was made at least six weeks before Alice made her film. However, she did not know it existed. Uh, the first film of the Lumiere that she saw was basically a commercial for their shoe factory. It shows all the workers leaving the factory. Most of us in the film business have hmm. seen this film. And there are five or six variations of it. And she saw that film and she writes in her memoirs, you know, that she went to her boss and she said, I could do something like that. We need something like that to sell our camera because the Lumiere's had a 35 millimeter camera and Gaumont had a 60 millimeter camera. So they were competing, uh, for, but for different parts of the market. Gaumont was aiming for the scientific community and the Lumiere's were trying to go wide and have audiences and stuff like that. So uh, Gaumont, since he didn't really care about the films themselves, he cared about having software bundled with his computer, if you want to compare it to, to sell the cameras, you know, he said to her, oh, okay, you can do that, but you can only do it during your lunch break. You know, the French have these long lunch breaks uh, and, and you have to make sure to finish your secretarial work for the day because she was his secretary. So that's what she did. She was already working a 12 hour day. That was a normal day. So she would take a four hour lunch break so she could film in daylight. She had to go up to the studio where they were working on the cameras, the engineers working on the cameras, work for three or four hours, then take the trolley back to the main office, which was closer to the Louvre, and then uh, finish her secretarial work. So she'd be working till 11 o'clock or midnight, but she had the bug, it was worth it for her. And after a few years, Gaumont said, oh, you can't be going back and forth like this. I need you at the studio full time. The demand, you know, by then they'd recognize that the films themselves were a product that could make money. So he needed her to make films full time. 
But her very first film was designed to sell cameras and the cameras were mostly purchased by men. So she has a lovely young woman who is a fairy who takes babies out from behind cabbages and she does a little dance. And, uh, you know, um, that is her first fiction film, but it is after the Lumieres. Okay, and and, um, and and just for the viewers who are understanding why babies are behind the cabbage, because that's what the rest of the world looks as, uh, you know, at the, at the stalk getting the baby. That's the that's the French version of it. So it was uh, it was a story that uh, she uh, that she wrote and directed uh, yeah. pretty early on. Cabbage um, open into a nice little, and it just looks like a little cradle. You just can imagine a little creature in it. So, yeah, um, you spoke a little bit about uh, about uh, how she, Alice Key is a pioneer in uh, sync sound for film as well, um, and you explained a little bit of, about the process. But what, was there a need for that at that time, or was that Alice Key's own? Uh, uh, initiation into like you know taking that and uh, working with sound for film was she, it because of uh, was it because of uh, you know the the competition that was coming from across the the pond or what was the uh, reason for that? Uh, it was recognized that silent films lacked sound. Obviously, you know you see everybody went to the opera, everyone went to the live theater. You watch a play, people talk, you can hear what they say. People sing, you can hear what they sing. So then when you go to a silent movie, the camera can move and you can have effects and you can go to remote locations. There's all sorts of wonderful things you can do that you can't do on stage, but you can't hear them. So they had the pianists, they had lecturers who would talk along with the image. Some people experimented with having actors behind the screen vocalizing along with the image. All sorts of variations of live sound were tried and were moderately successful for a time, but everybody recognized what you, they really wanted was sound that would go with the image. And phonographs were already a big thing. Everybody who could afford it had a phonograph in their home and listened to records. So it wasn't a big jump for an engineer like Leon Gaumont to think, how could I marry the two together? Now, in um, back in New Jersey, in the U.S., Edison said he was working on, uh, it was called the Kinetophone. We have one or two films that were made with that. But again, you were supposed to watch, it was a booth, you were supposed to look like this, and there was just a phonograph inside, and the two things had to work together. The films they have are very, very short. I am not sure it ever really worked properly. Edison was really good at propaganda. <laughs> so I'm not really sure. Um, but the Gaumont chronophone definitely worked as long as your uh, theater, the, the space where you were showing the films was small enough. It The sound could not project too loudly, which is one reason why selling it uh, basically failed in the US. But it didn't fail right away. There were all up and down the West Coast. There were theaters that had Gaumont chronophones and uh, in Canada and Montreal and in Toronto and in um, all up and down the East Coast. And then in Kansas, like Alice Guy and Herbert Blachet made a whole tour of Kansas demonstrating these devices and then selling them to places like ice skating rinks or like they would show them a uh, some films, including some chronophone films, and then they would move the chairs and everyone would go ice skating or roller skating or, um, you know, so it was to venues like that, entertainment venues for young people. Okay. Um, can we speak a little bit about um, the visual language that Alice Key was uh, so instrumental in, in, um, uh, in developing? Um, would I be wrong in inferring that she invented the close-up really I mean, growing up uh, everything that I read attributed that to D.W. Griffith especially with the movie Intolerance but she was the first person oh, no. to she was using close-ups way before Intolerance way yeah. way okay so I'll give you the timeline as as I know it from my own research so let's go back to the phonosense for a minute this is how she made them 
she would film actors who were on the live stage. So those actors only have one day off a week and that's Monday. So, you know, we it's still the same, right? You can see a play Tuesday through Sunday. On Sunday, there are two performances and, you know, and then they get one day off, poor things. So <laughs> she would get somebody popular from the vaudeville circuit, say a popular comedian or a popular singer, and she would make 10 films of him in one day. Wow. And we have some like th where there are three or four of their most popular songs. So first they would film him from head to toe, right? Because back then uh, they believed that the audience would feel cheated if they couldn't see the whole actor, right? But then once you filmed him from head to toe doing his first song, then you have his second and his third and his fourth, all the way up to the 10th or the 14th, you want to vary you know, there was pressure on her to vary the camera angle. The cameraman didn't want to do it, but she finally, and the easiest move was to get in closer and closer and closer and closer until finally, you can't really tell, but they're a little bit wider than this. It's, mm -hmm. We would call it a medium shot. Yeah. Um, but to them, that was unbelievably close, you know, and it's harder on the actor because remember, he's lip syncing to his own performance, right? Or her own. And now you can like really see his lips. And if he goes out of sync, it's going to be really obvious. So she usually did these last. And the, by then the actor would be mm -hmm. used to the whole procedure. And finally they would have the film, but then there'd be like, you know, slice of frame out here, slice of frame out there to get the whole thing to sync. So now she has these films and some of them are in close up. And and this was just to record a vaudeville performance, but then she makes a movie, um, the one we have that survived, she probably made some others, but the one we have that survived is called Madame des Envies, which means Madame has her cravings. And it's a very funny film and it's really groundbreaking. So this lady is walking with her husband in the park and the lady is very obviously pregnant, right? And there's this myth, it's sort of true, but I think it's mostly a myth, that pregnant ladies, when they hunger for something, they just have to have it. You know, the, the body is asking for some form of nutrition. And so she's being followed by her husband who's pulling a baby carriage that already has a baby in it. And baby number two is on the way. And they pass, uh, the first person they pass is a little girl on a park bench eating a sugar stick. So like a candy cane. And uh, the pregnant lady sees it and steals it, like steals candy from the little girl. What a horrible thing to do, right? And then we cut to the pregnant lady sucking on her candy stick, you know, in a kind of salacious way. And uh, it's a French movie after all. And um, really enjoying it until the husband comes, the father of the little girl comes running out and beats up on the husband you know, for letting his wife steal his little girl's candy. And the husband gives him some money and the guy like grabs the little girl and says, okay, I'll get you another one. And they, and they leave. But the, what really shook everyone and surprised everyone was that close up of the woman enjoying, like we're getting, it, it's the first reaction shot. You know, we saw her steal the candy and now we see her enjoying it. And then we cut to the result, which was her husband, you know, getting beaten up and having to pay for the candy stick. And then she steals like five or six more things. She steals a banana from a beggar. She steals a pipe from a peddler who's selling goods. And every time we cut to her enjoying this thing, like with great, you know, physical abandon. And is and she has a very rubbery face. She was a very good comedic actress. Alice used her in other films too. I don't know her name, unfortunately, but uh, she she did a great job. So it's very funny. So then after that, you know, everybody started doing it, like using closer shots. Uh, Alice did it herself in her Life of Christ movie. There's mm -hmm. only one, but you have Veronica and like Christ goes by, he's carrying the cross. He's got blood dripping down his face and sweat and tears and Veronica wipes his face with her veil and then miraculously his face appears on her veil and and Alice Key shows that it's a little bit wider than a medium but it's still close up for the time mm -hmm. 
just shows Veronica holding up the veil with Jesus's face on it. So she used it. It wasn't only used comically, but they, they didn't become common until later. But that was that was the beginning. And that was 1906. Madame des Envies and the life of Christ were 1906. And um, about, apart from the, the visual language, the business side of film is something which she uh, she was well versed in. And um, she brought that to the U.S. as well, like you had mentioned earlier, that she had to move to the States because her husband was uh, sent by uh, by the company to help sell the products uh, because he spoke English. So she came with him and she ended up setting up the first studio, Solex Studios, in New Jersey. Um, it wasn't okay. until it but wasn't Solex, until this year. Solex. Sorry, go ahead. Let's go back through the Solex history. Um, mm. First of all, Solex wasn't the first film in Fort Lee. Fort Lee was a film town. It was Hollywood before Hollywood. And it's really sad that that history is not well known. We really need in-depth scholarship on that. What we do know about Fort Lee is all the result of the work of some volunteers headed by Tom Myers and his friend Lou Azzolini and Allison Brennan, some other people who basically tried to preserve some of the old film studios that were there. They taught people, they had events for the public. Um, and Tom Myers was the main force behind building the Barrymore Film Center where all of those efforts are now. They have a museum, they have an archive. I haven't seen it yet, unfortunately. It only opened recently. Uh, and, um, and they show films, they have film festivals. So, the film history of Fort Lee is really a treasure that needs to be explored. One documentary called it Hollywood Before Hollywood, and that mm. is really correct. There were many studios. The first studio to open was the Champion Film Studio in 1909. Uh, I have my list because I don't. Uh, Eclair, who was a French film company, mm. um, built a studio in 1911. And... Um, Oh, where's my list? Uh, Pathé had a huge studio, not in Fort Lee itself, but close by. Edison was in Orange, which is not so far away, and he was making kinetoscope films there. Uh, Victor opened a studio in 1912, and then Solax. So Solax was the fourth or the fifth. But there were studios in Chicago, uh, even Florida, Arizona. Some people realize it's much easier to make movies outside if you're in a warm place. So they were mm. starting to move to warm places. There was the uh, studio in uh, New Rochelle. Um, name just went out of my head, but and some well-known studios. There were some black filmmakers making films in Chicago, Ebony Film, unfortunately. Not, not all of them had their own studios. There were film companies working everywhere, but the Fort Lee people had their own film studios. It was a big okay. center. Um, so, but how did Solex start? It didn't start in Fort Lee. It actually started in 1910 in Flushing, New York, which if you remember is where the Gramont Chronophone Studio was. Yeah. So what happened is Alice had her baby. The baby's like a year old, it's 1909, 1910. And she goes to the studio to see her husband. She would bring him lunch. They would eat lunch together. He would see the baby. And then she would go home and he would continue working. But she be, she noticed that nothing was happening at the studio. Uh, and that's because Glom Edison had sued Gaumont over the chronophone. He wanted to push Gaumont out of business and force him to go back to France and Gaumont was fighting it in court. And uh, while that was happening though, they couldn't make any films. So then Alice said, hey, I've got a solution to this. I'll start my own film company, actually Gaumont and Gaumont supported it, uh, but Herbert was, was uh, part of the board of the company. So they were actually doing it together. But she started her own film company. She used his studio, um, and process the films there. And then Gaumont distributed them using his distributing arm. So basically she has no overhead. 
Of course, she's sharing her profits with Gaumont. She's helping Gaumont, Gaumont American side from going under financially, and she's getting rich. They got rich. They got rich enough that she could afford to build the studio in Fort Lee. That studio cost $100,000. About half of it she paid for by selling her Gaumont stock back to Gaumont. She had employee stock. And she had the money. I mean, she bought a house at the same time and they bought a car, which they used in some of their films. So they they had money to spare, but that was only true as long as Gaumont was distributing her films. And when Edison finally won his case and Gaumont had to stop doing business in the US, he also kind of lost the will to keep fighting because World War I started mm -hmm. 1914. And then he felt that his place was back in France making films to support the war effort. So that's what he did. He went back to France and did his duty as a French patriot. But that left Alice Key and Herbert, uh, you know, in the cold, basically. They had to distribute their films themselves, which was a state rights system. You had to go from territory to territory and sell the films. And that was much, much more costly and not as you didn't get as much money from it. And eventually they, they kept trying different things. They kept forming different companies and, and raising new investment, but eventually um, they had to go bankrupt and they both became directors for hire. Yeah. And um, that, that was one of the things, like you said, you know, the, the, uh, the company went bankrupt and I think by 1917, then she had to pack up and just go back because by then, marital problems were also surfacing and that was affecting her work as well. Right. She didn't go bankrupt in 1917. In 1917, they they started renting their studio plant. So that's when Metro came in. Metro yeah. eventually joined with two other companies and became Metro Goldwyn Mayer, which is the MGM that's MGM. Still making films. Uh, and they leased it to other companies too. But they were still doing business that they were working for bigger film companies like she made films for Hearst and they both directed films for Metro before that. And those were feature films like another reason that they were having problems is that up until 1913, most films were one reel. That's 13 to 15 minutes. So you can you can make that with the money that you have. Right. But when you have to make a film that's three reels, five reels, seven reels. Now, all of a sudden, you're looking at a big financial outlay up front before you can get your money back. And uh, things became much more stressful. But there was a period of about two years from about uh, 1915, 16, 17, two and a half years, where they were taking turns making films for Metro for popular plays and players. Like I said, they kept making new companies, raising new financing and they kept going. So he would direct a feature film and she would produce it. And then she would direct a feature film and he would produce it once a month. So they were directing, you know, 12 films a year <laughs> like this. I mean, the stress and the work and the hours was unbelievable. And but the fact that they were both directing and producing meant that there wasn't anybody really selling, which had been Herbert's job to begin with, and mm -hmm. that they weren't getting their money back. And then we have the fact that Alice has two children by now and she's raising them like, you know, the husband isn't doing all that much raising kids at that time. And he's eight years younger than she is. And actresses today, then as now, you know, they know they're more likely to get cast for a part if they make the director feel loved, shall we say. And uh, they were just throwing themselves at him and he wasn't very good at resisting temptation. So that kind of eroded a marriage that, a marriage and business partnership that was already under a huge amount of stress. And of course, World War I was on mm -hmm. and Alice was very concerned about what was happening to her extended family and her homeland and so that is like another level of horror added on to that but then the last straw came in 1918 with a spanish influenza you know we know what it feels like to be through a pandemic like that now and alice got it and almost died and that was uh while it, she was ill herbert went to the states with one of those actresses 
and decided to go to work there. He'd had offers. He'd actually been trying to convince her to go uh, for a couple of years. So this was another point of dissension. He recognized that the business was moving west, but she had put everything she had, her heart, her soul, and every penny into that studio plant, into the Solex studio plant. And she just couldn't see selling it off for the price of brick, which is eventually what she had to do. Uh, she just couldn't give up, couldn't give up. She wasn't the kind of person to give up. So finally he said, look, you know, the writing's on the wall. This is, if you don't go with me, I'm going. So he went and then she got sick. He came back and he took her to California with him. But by then, you know, the marriage was over. So he was still taking care of her, helping her get work, mostly working as his assistant, taking care of the children, but they lived separately. And finally, she just felt like she was too far from home and she agreed to a divorce. She, uh, there was a fire at the Solax plant in 1919, and that was really the last straw. One of the tenants lit, you know, the lights that they had at the time and the nitrate film, there was a fire and one part of the buildings burnt down. So that was the end. They really couldn't rebuild. So she had to auction it all off. And then she returned to France. So she did try to continue her career in France. So the first thing she did was go back to Gaumont. Now we're in between the wars, right? But there's a terrible economic recession. There is no money. So one of the things Gaumont wants to do is um, revitalize his studio in Nice in the south of France. And Alice had family there. So she went there to live and she made a plan for turning that studio into what it could be. The only problem is, is that she was used to doing business in the States where there was more money, bigger audiences, more mm -hmm. financing. And Gaumont had to reject her plan because they did not, in between the wars, there's just no money. Yeah. Uh, and, it was just just really expensive for them to go for it. Right. But he did he did give her a shot. So then after that, she had to recognize her career was over. She ended up uh, going to schools and talking to girls' schools about her film career, what that was like. She wrote novelizations of films that were published in popular magazines. She did whatever work she could do. And it wasn't until she was in her late 70s, I think, that she realized that history books were being written about the silent film era, and she was not being mentioned in any of them. And then she started making those notes you mentioned and uh, and wrote her memoirs. And we really owe it to Anthony Slide, who made sure those memoirs got published in English and has championed her work ever since, since the mid 70s. If it weren't for him and a Belgian scholar, um, Victor Bashi in Belgium. Who was actually her neighbor and they just, yeah, he just found out that she's living there and he ended up recording uh, and doing interviews with her. Yes, he he did several interviews. We we still have one and um, uh, it was eye opening. And he was able to write about her. He He did, like I basically redid his research when I started he went around looking for her films because since she had done all this work for hire, unlike Méliès, Méliès kept all his films because he had his own film company. The Lumières kept all their films because they had their own film company. They were their films, but all of her work was for hire, so she didn't own them. So there was no no way of, of finding them. Some of them, you know, basically most of the ones that we found were projectionists who still had a box somewhere in an attic with some films in it. Like they died or gone out of business and the box got left in the attic and then somebody found it. There are many stories like that. One guy buried all the films in the ground, which was great for the film preservation because no humidity, no. So when somebody dug it up by accident, a hundred years later, they were in good condition. We have some beautiful films because of that. And uh, her daughter, Simone, who was actually born uh, in the States when she moved, uh, has also been uh, a huge champion of her work in getting the word out there about her mother and uh, some of the uh, early interviews uh, that we have about Alice, uh, you know, about, as a mother, as a businesswoman, they're all coming from Simone, apart from the ones that Alice gave herself. 
Um, yes. Did you did you get a chance to talk to her? What what's no, I I did um write to them. It was actually Simone and Roberta Blaché, who was married to Simone's brother. And Simone's brother had passed, Reginald Blaché. He he but the, the sister and sister-in-law uh translated Alice Key's memoirs from French to English and edited it. And then Anthony Slide edited it further and got it published in English. The French version had been published by someone else. And um, Anthony Slide interviewed Simone on film. That's the interview you're referring to in a film called Silent Feminists, I think. And, um, and Roberta also, like, I did meet Roberta and I was friends with her for years and she talked to me a lot and she's the one who had kept what few documents of Alice's we have, which are now in an archive at the Museum of Modern Art. So we definitely owe it to both of them for keeping the records in spite of wars and moves and economic depression and they, they kept everything together. But it's kind of ironic because Simone grew up with this mother who was a successful filmmaker. Like any child whose parents have demanding jobs, they don't like it. <laughs> mommy and daddy aren't home. You know, where's mommy and daddy? And they had nannies and they also went to boarding schools and they did not like that one bit. They wanted mommy and daddy. So Simone never and Reginald never liked going to the movies because movies made them angry they Roberta told me this in later years because they were they were bitter about their parents being so busy uh and not paying attention to them but at the end at the end of uh Alice's life Alice lived with Simone all of her life after the divorce and Simone ended up supporting her in her old age. And she had a very long old age. She was 94 when she died. Mm. Um, at the end, uh, Simone respected her mother's career and did what she could to preserve the history of it. And um, my last question about uh, Alice is going to be about her legacy. Why? Uh, what's her legacy been 100 years, you know, um, from? From when cinema started it's been more than 100 years now but what's her legacy been and uh why why is it important that we recognize her and remember her for the filmmaker that she was well i believe it's important to recognize every artist uh you know whether they hit the big time financially or not um they all have something to contribute to the culture and there are a lot of silent filmmakers who who are have been lost or will be lost because they don't have a champion like me or Tom Myers or Anthony Slide or Simone to uh, preserve their legacy. But what's important about Alice is that she was a woman and she was there from the very beginning at a time when, you know, in the U.S., she was kind of a sensation. She got a lot of press because she was a woman running her own film studio. She was definitely the first woman to run her own own and run her own film studio. Other women owned film companies, but she had a studio that was a first. So there were headlines like little woman runs film business all by herself. Like, oh, wow, I can't believe that this. And Alice Key was very petite, you know, very typical petite French lady. She, I, I don't think she hit five foot. Um, I'm not really sure, but she was very small. So that made it even more impressive that she was running this big business, you know, going to meetings with men. But that also added to her trouble. This is one reason why Herbert had to do the business side, because they didn't really want her in the meetings. Herbert said to her, if you're in the room, they can't chew tobacco and spit, you know, into the spittoons because you're not supposed to do that in front of ladies. <laughs> <laughs> so then they didn't want her at the meetings because then they couldn't like smoke cigars and chew tobacco. So th those are stupid problems. But the so what I'm trying to get at is that she's important to us because she's a role model. She persisted and she managed to do it while still having a marriage that, although it didn't end well, it was really an amazing marriage of business partners and parental partners. And 
you know, they had this disagreement about going to Hollywood at the end and that kind of, you know, was the last straw. But until that moment, it really was like, you know, the rest of us who are tried to make films or be an artist just can only dream of having a partnership like that with our partner. Uh, and it, it worked for a very long time. So some people forget that because of how it ended, but I would like people to remember that there are, Alice Key would not have had a feature film career if she hadn't had been married to Herbert and if that partnership had not existed. Unfortunately, most of her feature films are lost. We only have three of them. Two of them are in a partial state. So we only have a very vague idea of what her feature film work was like, but it was still good from the reviews we can tell. She she went from the one minute films in the very beginning to five reels at the end. And she was still, uh, you know, breaking barriers and pushing the envelope. But then it's not just that she was a woman that matters. She also invented cinematic language as we know it. The main thing that she did that the Lumieres did not do, Melies did not do, Edison did not do, Porter working for Edison, um, none of those people. What she did was, she did what books do. She focused on the internal psychology, the internal emotional state of a character, starting with those close-ups. And she followed one character through the story. And remember, these are all like, mainframe shots so all the action is head to toe in one frame and then you cut to a new scene all the action is head to toe from one frame so she didn't have close-ups and reaction shots like we have now and she didn't have the musical score and you know she had no idea what the pianist was going to play they would just make up they improvised mostly as they went along so she had to rely on the actors performances and what little variation in camera work was acceptable at the time. And even with those unbelievable limitations, she made these stories. Um, and one example is, um, it's called The Stepmother. So this man is a widower and he has a 12, like a 10 year old boy, eight or 10 year old boy. And he marries another lady who, who's a widow and has a little girl. And he thinks, oh, great, I've now found a new mother for my child. But actually, the stepmother is very mean. She she takes good care of her little girl, but she tortures the little boy. And in the end, of course, uh, the police find out. They see the bruises on him, and the husband kicks her out and takes care of his child finally. But the whole story is told from the perspective of the little boy. We see him, you know, alone visiting his mother's grave then we see him with his father then we see him with the stepmother then we see the stepmother torturing him but it's all from his perspective even though she didn't have you know shot reverse shot didn't have any of that but she understood that the single psychological thread for us to put ourselves into his emotional shoes and follow him through that story that is what mattered and other people uh tried to imitate what she did and they would miss miss the point um i'll give you an example um she made a film about uh again um, a mother who has two boys and she's a widow right after the war there's a lot of that mm. and or the she's not a widow in the beginning her husband is a um a game warden on an estate and he's protecting the estate and two poachers come and uh, he, they, they're stealing game from the estate. So he tries to arrest them and they murder him. And the little boy who's been following his father, you know, sort of hanging back, witnesses the murder. And the little boy follows the bad guys and tries to bring them to justice. And uh, in the end, he, he manages to lead them to their deaths. Like they, he doesn't kill them himself they fall off of a cliff because they're trying to run away from him. And then you see, um, so, so that's how it ends. He leads them to their death, but he doesn't kill them. So the filmmaker at Pathé copied her film, like 
one of the reasons we know her films were successful is because other filmmakers would copy them frame by frame. They would have actors who would spy, like they would act for her and then they would go and act for her yeah. or Pathé. So they would get the dirt on it and try to get their film out at the same time. That still happens now. You know, you get like competing. Uh, um, but at the time, it wasn't illegal. There were no, those rules weren't in place yet. So their copy, first, uh, the little boy, you know, the father's murdered. The little boy follows the bad guys. He overhears what they're saying and he wants to get his revenge and he gets his revenge by killing them. Well, that's not good. We don't want to see the little boy turn into a monster. We want mm -hmm. him to get justice, right? So it's clear that uh, the guy didn't quite understand, <laughs> you know, what mattered here. And then the film ends with they find the game warden at the bottom of the cliff because the bad guys push him off a cliff. And you have this beautiful scene. I call them Pieta scenes, you know, like the Virgin Mary. Yep. Dead Christ. Well, they're staged like that, and the and the mother, it's the same woman who was in Madame de Zanvi, is is holding the her dead husband, and she is such a great performer that you're only focusing on her, and the focus is removed from the boy. Whereas in Alice's film, even though I'm talking about a main shot, you know, clearly the we're still with him, like the way he's standing there and his mother's weeping, and he's like. He knows he has to be the man in the family now. Like he's he's grown up. He got justice for his father, and now he's got to, you know, in the space of like one day, he has got to start helping his grieving mother and take care of his younger brother. And it's all on him. So that is really what she did. She brought that to the game. Nobody else had thought of it. Nobody else could do it. They tried to copy how she did it, and they weren't as good as her. Eventually, people like D.W. Griffith began to catch on and, and do use some of the same techniques and follow the same psychology. But it took a long time. Griffith really didn't start working. You know, Alice made that game warden film in 1906, and Griffith wasn't really working until 1913, and he didn't quite get the hang of it for a few years. So it took like a decade for her accomplishment to really be picked up by the industry, but by then everyone had forgotten hmm. who invented it. And, you know, it it took it takes someone like a film scholar to spend years looking at these films, comparing them all, and figuring out it. You know, silent film is a language that's kind of lost to us. When I first found those films and I went into that basement and put them on the projector and watched them again, the first one I looked at, I was like, "Who are these people?" What are they doing? What is this story about? I, I have no idea. Like I grew up on, you know, classic Hollywood cinema and with all of its bells and whistles. And I suddenly knew I was going to have to get a PhD. I was going to have to write a book. I was going to have to, you know, I was going to need help. I wasn't just going to be able to write an article and go back to filmmaking. It was going to be a job. Well, you know, we're, we're certainly glad that you took up the task. It was, uh, I'm sure it was a huge challenge, but thank you so much for that because, uh, you know, the world now knows more about Alice Key, about her legacy. Um, and I can't thank you enough for coming and talking to us at Jeff and uh, Gandhara Independent Film Festival is... Uh, so much richer for having you on uh, and talking to us and this entire uh, one hour has been uh, absolutely amazing to just hear you talk about her and uh, the history and you know uh, I'm uh, I'm really glad that you came uh, thank you so much well thank you thank you it's really um, you know I can my book is basically out of print already it's really film festivals like yours and efforts like what you're doing and the documentaries that have been made those are what people really have access to. So we really need all of this for people to know who Alice is and the other silent film filmmakers. Um, the last thing I am gonna leave the audience with is uh, if you can get your hands on the book, uh, it's uh, Alice Guy Blaché, Lost Visionary of uh, Cinema. Um, if you can get your hands on it, it's a wonderful read. There is a documentary as well, which is actually based on the book. Uh, it's called uh, Be Natural, uh, which again, like uh, Dr. McMahon was saying, um, 
uh, Alice Key was an incredible director. And one of the things that she always asked of her actors was to just be natural. It's something that all directors, they strive for now, but she was doing this way, way back. It was a huge sign uh, on her studio. It was just to be natural, to act natural. And that's why we respond to those characters in the story. Uh, but, you know, if you can get your hands on the book, uh, please do give it a read. It'll open up a new world for you. Again, Dr. McMahon, thank you so much for coming on board. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. I look forward to your film festival. I will definitely uh, share the link with you and uh, you can see what's happening. There's so many other female filmmakers uh, who are out there and, uh, you know, uh, hopefully um, one of them will, will be the next uh, Alice Key Blaché, you know, trailblazing the, the path for people coming after her. That's her real role now is inspiring the rest of us. <laughs>